Hello, my wonderful students. So we're back. So we're going to move on to the chemistry portion <clears throat> of my lecture. Like I said, I like to kind of do them separately so that you can go and stop, go and stop, right? So this is chapter two. Let's go into it. So let us start. Now, like I expressed to you guys, I have a lot of information in your modules in the class, in the Canvas, to help you, to guide you um, along with the lectures. Um, so please make sure that you're pairing everything together in order for you to get the most out of my lectures, okay? So let's go ahead. Everything that occupies space and weight is made up of matter. So let's talk about matter just a little bit. Um, this includes everything from air to your shoes is what we consider matter. Matter comes in three forms. It comes in solid, it comes in liquid, and it comes in gas. Now, you guys will see me um, looking at my PowerPoint and my PowerPoint notes. That's why you see my eyes kind of going up, okay? Now, matter can undergo a couple of different types of changes. It could go under a chemical change, a physical change. So when I say chemical changes, um, I want you to kind of um, think about like logs. Yeah, so think about like logs. Logs being cut and chipped into sawdust, okay? The wood has changed, but the appearance of it has changed. But the wood is still wood, right? It's still the exact same. Hold on, guys. It's still wood, right? It's just changed. So then when we talk about chemical change, chemical change is the wood being burned into ashes. That's the chemical change. The wood composition actually changes. It is no longer wood. It is now ashes. So that's a chemical change. Um, so it went from a physical change. It was a log of wood. We chopped it. We turned it into sawdust, right? Chips of wood. That's physically changing it. Then we burn the wood. And when we burn the wood, it was a chemical change and it changed into ashes. That's what I'm referring to, okay? So the body can perform physical and chemical changes as well. A physical change uh, is basically like when you chew food, all right? And the chemical change is when you digest the food by your digestive juices breaking the food up into something different i.e. physical change to a chemical change. Let's say it again. Physically, that chicken wing, once you chew it up, does not look like that chicken wing. But it's still a chicken wing, okay? Physical change. Chemical change. Once your body starts to digest it, it is now moving into other properties where some of it is going to be taken out in order for you to use it nutritionally, right? chemical change. So then we have elements. Let's look at what the word elements mean. Elements are what all matter is made up of. Everything is made up of an element. Uh, there are 92 natural occurring elements and 20 man-made elements. So some examples of elements are liquids such as mercury in a thermometer, which you barely ever see anymore, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, those are some gases, solids that are elements such as gold and silver, these are still elements. All elements have a name, it has a chemical symbol, and it has a number. 
Then we have trace elements, okay? Trace elements, these are just elements which are found in tiny amounts. They're, so we don't have large amounts of them. We coin them tiny elements. Some of these are required by the body. So the, there's tiny elements in your human body. There are a few elements that you would need to be familiar with as far as the chemical symbol um, that is on the periodic table. So I want you guys to make sure that you're looking at the periodic table. I don't want you to memorize the whole table, but I want to tell you, please take notes of these because these are the ones I want you to memorize. I want you to memorize these common classic symbols. So when you're looking at the periodic table, circle potassium, which is the K plus, circle sodium, which is the Na, circle chloride, which is the Cl, circle potassium chloride, which is the KCl, circle sodium chloride, NaCl, circle phosphorus, which is P, circle oxygen, which is O, circle carbon, which is C, all right? Now, also make note that there are four elements that make up 90% of the human body. I need you to know these. The four elements that make up 90% of the human body is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and the other 4% is of those trace elements that we were talking about, those tiny elements. They are copper, iodine, phosphorus, and et cetera, that I know that you'll see but those are the most important, okay? Now, I want to tell you to break, sometimes I like to break down the words. It helps you to understand it better. Um, so I want to talk about the atoms right now, okay? So the biggest word when I'm talking about atoms is isotype. Okay, so isotype, the word iso means the same. Just remember that. The word iso means the same. So isotype is different. For, it's a different form of like O positive. It's the same atom. All right. So iso means the same. Remember that. Um, I want you to remember that the nucleus is in the center of the atom. Remember that. I want you to um, also remember that it is also the home of the proton. The atom is the home of the proton. Remember that. Now let's talk about chemical bonds. So there's an ion, it's a group of atoms with a negative and a positive charge, right? So either missing or have extra electrons. So when we say Cata, that cation, that's C-A-T-I-O-N, that's an ion with a positive charge. So cation is an ion with a positive charge. And anon, like anon, like negative, like not, um, that is an ion with a negative charge, okay? Ionic bonds, that is a bond that's formed by an exchange, okay? And the... Um, Covalent bond is a bond formed by sharing of electrons, all right? So, remember, an equals negative. So, an is the negative charge. That's how I tell people to differentiate between the cation and the anion. Anion, the absence of, all right? Um, a ionic bond, make note of this, an ionic bond is sodium and chloride. That is what we consider an ionic bond. A covalent bond is water and carbon. Make a note of that. So an anion, an anion is, for example, chloride. It has a negative charge. So I'm continuing to tell you that you must know what is an anion and what is a cation. Y'all need to know the difference between them. So, let's look a little bit closer at our 
ions, all right? The most common ions is sodium, potassium, and chloride. So I need you to understand that electrolytes, as you have just heard me mention them, um, forms ions when they are dissolved, okay? So we know there are cations and anions, right? We know that. We know that one's positive and one's negative, okay? So you know that the um, chloride is negatively charged. I've said that like three times, so you must just guess that that may be on your test. All right? Let's look at some common ions that are in your book and make sure that you learn the symbols. You will be dealing with these from now on. You will see them on labs. You will see them in med surge. You will see them over and over, which is why you need to understand what they do and what's the difference. And you also need to know how they work, okay? Our blood is composed mostly of water. When we eat or drink something with electrolytes, such as potassium, this creates a cation and can affect our nerves and muscles because it has the vitamin, the uh, uh, K plus, look that up, what's K plus, which has a positive charge on it, okay? You have to wait one moment, please. Sorry. So, this is why when you eat a banana or you have something with potassium in it, it can prevent leg cramps because it has a what? Positive charge. All right. So, now let's talk a little bit more about electrolytes. Electrolytes have to be present in exactly the right portions in the cell and outside of the cell or the cell cannot proper functionally. If people have their electrolytes malfunctioning or improperly balanced, it can actually affect their heart. Now, let's move back on to molecules. Molecules contain two or more of the same atom, like oxygen, right? Oxygen has O2. Common uh, compounds contain two or more different atoms. Also, another one is water, H2O. Oxygen is a molecule, but not a compound, because it contains two of the same atoms. Water is both a molecule and a compound, because it contains two of the same and a different Okay, it has two of the same and a different. So I need you guys to remember, if it has two of the same molecules, it's just a molecule, right? If it has different, it is a compound. That's easy enough to remember. So when you're looking at a picture of a carbon dioxide or water molecule, you will see what's when there's more of one type or if there is a if it's a compound or if it's just a molecule. So, compounds are molecules formed of two or more different atoms. We gave you an example, but I need you to remember why because there are questions that basically state is this a molecule or is this a compound? The most, the easiest way to know that and to never ever forget it is that if it has the same molecule, the molecule is a molecule is a molecule. That's it. If it has different ones, it is a compound. We took two different things and put them together and made a compound. All right? That's what I need you to know. So water is essential for life. Water is the most abundant compound in the body. It is a participant in all chemical reactions that occur in the body. Water accounts for about 80% of our body mass. 
As far as chemical properties go, it is the universal solvent. It can dissolve. It, this is what I want to say. It can dissolve hydrolytic. Hydrolytic is a water-loving substance. An example of that is like gases, proteins, carbs, salts. Those are what we call hydrolytics. Those are chemical properties. They are water loving. If something cannot be dissolved, it is called hydrophobic. So like hydrophobic, afraid of, fearful, won't do it. Um, those chemical properties are water fearing, won't do it, won't dissolve. They're hydrophobic. An example of a hydrophobic is fats. Water is also chemically active and many reactions in, are involved in it. Now let's talk about physical properties of water. It's important in heat transferring, uh, meaning it conducts heat well. The water in blood is usually important because it keeps the blood warm or it keeps the blood cool. So those are really, really needed. I also wrote on here and wanted to give you more examples of hydrolytics and hydrophobics. Okay. Remember, hydrolytic is a water loving. It will dissolve. Hydrophobic means that it does not like water. It fears it and it will not dissolve. So um, let's see here. Salt, we know. Butter, what do you think about that? Sugar, what do you think about that? Does sugar dissolve? Yes. Olive oil, mm, what do you think about that? But then, like, what do you think about detergent? Detergent, that's a little different. It brings together hydrophobic and hydrolytic substances, so it's, it's kind of what we call a amphi, uh, amphipathic. Uh, which means it does both, but we know salt dissolves, we know sugar dissolves, we know olive oil does not, right? Now let's talk about a deficiency in water. A deficiency is water, what we call um, dehydrated, and dehydration can be very, very dangerous. Um, water is needed to absorb things like nutrients, and it is used to transport things like blood cells and gases, and you actually need, and it requires water when these exchanges in the lungs are being done. So if you have a client or a patient that is um, de dehydrated, that it is stopping these things from naturally occurring in the body. Water is also needed to cool us off from when we form sweat. And um, I want to give you the degrees of which water freezes and boils. Just take a note of this. Uh, water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit and water boils at 212 Fahrenheit the last time I checked. Water, as I said, is a universal solvent. Know that water is temperature regulated. Water is an ideal lubricant, know that. Water plays an important role in chemical reaction and water is important for protection. Most substances will dissolve in water. Um, <clears throat> it is also a major component in mucus because it is a lubricating fluid. Um, also, it is in synovial fluid and it is needed to digest carbs. So let's go ahead and move into a little bit of discussion on oxygen. Oxygen is required for all of the cells to survive, okay? All of the cells, it is essential to life. It powers the body, oxygen does. When there's a lack of oxygen to any of the cell or tissue, necrosis can begin, and necrosis means death, which means that it will begin to die. That cell will begin to die. So now let's talk about carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an important compound consisting of one carbon <clears throat> and two oxygens. 
which would make it a what? A compound. Um, it is waste product. Pro I'm sorry, it is waste produced and it must be eliminated from the body. Can't keep it. Okay. Okay, here we go. Catalysts and enzymes. Let's talk about it. So a catalyst speeds up a chemical reaction. It's a catalyst. It's what gets the party started. It's what gets everything going. Oftentimes, the catalyst is made up of proteins. When this is the case, the catalyst is then called an enzyme, okay? So I always tell people, like, the catalyst is the party starter. It's, your, it's in your friend group. They, whoever's the one who gets the party started, that's the catalyst. They get everything going. But then, once the catalyst takes off and everybody starts to participate, it becomes a party. It's the enzyme, right? An example of this that is medical is an enzyme um, is um, it's done, it's really secreted by the pancreas and it is secreted from there and it breaks down the food once it is reached into the intestines. So it is the catalyst that gets the digestion started, right? Digestion started. It is the catalyst. Now, acid bases are something that's kind of difficult for the students to learn. Um, I have several videos on it in your modules so that you can get an understanding don't overcomplicate it. So there's acid and there's base and there's salt, right? A normal functioning body requires a balance between substances classified as acid and or bases. Acid base balance is very important because the chemical reaction in our body occurs only when these substances are in balance. An imbalance of acid base can cause life-threatening clinical problems for your client. When we talk about acid base, we must also talk about the pH scale. Please make note that a normal pH that is neutral is 7.0. The more hydrogen makes it acidic, the less hydrogen makes it um, alkaline. All right? So, the greater number of hydrogen ions in a solution, the greater the acidity, like urine. Urine is very acidic, okay? When hydrogen is less, the solution becomes more alkaline, like blood, okay? The, um, the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. 0 is the most acidic, all right? 14 is the most alkaline. You will also maybe see that as noted as base, basic, all right? Since 7.0 is neutral, anything less than 7.0 is considered acidic, and anything higher is considered alkaline. I'm telling you a, different, a million different ways. Each increase or decrease in units signifies a change in the ions times 10. So even though you may see a slight change, it's a huge deal, all right? Bo blood and other body fluids are close to neutral, leaning a tad bit more to the alkaline side. Like I said, blood is alkaline. So blood is about the pH of 7.35 to 7.45. When blood is not neutral, the patient is said to have acidosis or alkalosis, right? You'll get more into that when you are in med surge, but if you don't get the understanding of what acidosis and alkalosis is right now, just on the sheer health science side of it, when we start talking to you about these chemical, these deficiencies, these chemical changes in the body when it comes to disease process, you're going to be a little lost. So I want you to understand them now. Then we have buffers. Buffers are chemicals to prevent a sharp rise or a quick fall in the pH. It is very important 
and maintaining stability in the body's fluids. Normal pH is altered. If it is altered, it can be fatal, but buffers are used to correct things like acidosis. Buffers can be given through IV fluid or the body itself, body's systems, to produce its own buffers. We note that often in the kidneys and in the lungs. If alkalosis occurs, this usually steps are taken to prevent the body from producing so much bicarb. That's what the lungs and things will do in order to try to self-preserve. Now, one of the easiest things for me to do is to tell my students, hey, you need something in your thought that's going to remind you of what is acidosis, where it's neutral, and then what is um, alkaline, okay? So I always say, get a... Uh, get a piece of paper. So everybody get a piece of paper out. Draw one line straight down and like an arrow, an arrow at the top and then an arrow at the bottom. And then in the middle, in the middle, kind of put um, a straight line, right? At the top, I want you to write, um, at the top, I want you to write, this is, how do I want you to say it? This is acidic. At the bottom, I want you to write, this is alkaline. All right? And then in the middle, you put neutral. So when you draw an arrow pointing up and down, now at the top, you put the arrow, you put acidic, that is 7.35 or less, okay? And then in the middle, you put neutral. Neutral kind of sits between, you know, seven. And then on the bottom, you put alkaline, and that is 7.25 or greater. Now, just to give you um, some thoughts on that, a few thoughts on where things lie, all right? So that you can have a visual of what you're looking at. Okay, now energy. Let's talk about energy and how your body uses energy and what happens, okay? Energy is the ability to do work. There are six forms of energy, okay? Now, food is used by the body and energy is released. The body cannot use energy in the form that it is provided. When our food is then broken down, it can use it. So, this energy is transferred to molecules per ATP. All right. So write ATP. ATP is basically held together by chemical bonds. When the energy is needed, the chemical bonds are then broken and energy is then released. ATP then powers the body because the ATP can be used directly in the cell. Now, I just said there's six forms, right? So let's look at those six forms. There's chemical, Chemical form of energy causes movement. Then we have the um, mechanical, I'm sorry, mechanical causes movement. Then we have chemical. Chemical is stored in chemical bonds. Then we have the electrical. Electrical is energy released from the movement of the charged molecules. We've talked about the charged molecules. Then we have radiant, all right? Radiant is energy that travels in waves. Radiant, like radiation. Then we have thermal. Y'all think of thermal? Y'all think of what? Heat, cold. Thermal is transferred because of a temperature difference. For example, um, if you deliver a baby and you put the baby on a cold surface, then that thermal energy is transferred. The baby will lose body heat. Okay. Then another form of energy is nuclear. Nuclear is energy released during the decay of a radioactive substance. Please make note that ATP is produced in the mitochondria of the cell. This is a very important um, fact 
that I need you guys to know. Please make note that the ATP is produced in the chondria of the cell. Mixtures and solutions and suspensions. I only have a little bit to say about this. Um, and then we're going to close out this particular part of the lecture. So a mixture is a combination of two substances like sugar and salt. When you add these substances together, it does not change either solution, okay? If you take away the sugar, you will still have the salt. They don't come together to make a different thing. Keep in mind that mixtures are things that are capable of being separated. So you mix it together, you can still separate them out, hence it makes it a mixture. But then you have solution. Solutions are a type of mixtures. But more specifically, the particles remain evenly distributed. So in other words, you can dissolve something into another thing. For example, a solution is like when you dissolve salt into water. The salt evenly distributes in the water. That is a solution, all right? There are two parts to solutions. There is the solute, the solute is the substance that is being dissolved, i.e. the, the uh, salt. Then you have the solvent. The solvent is what's doing the dissolving, i.e. the water. Suspensions are a little different. Suspensions. Suspensions are a little different. They are still a mixture, but these particles are not dissolved, okay? Most of the time, you have some of the particles to sink to the bottom or rise to the top. Unless you use or you were to constantly shake the mixture, then the suspensions will always have something that gradiates to the bottom. A good example of this is like Italian dressing, right? When you take it out the refrigerator, you see all of the stuff at the very bottom, right? And you got to shake it up so that it is evenly distributed for a few seconds. But then after that, it's going to do what? It's going to dissolve again. So that's why it's very important when you are given a medication that is a suspension that you always mix it up. You have to shake it because the heavier particles will go down to the bottom. And when a suspension of a medication, you may not see it, but because you understand how suspensions work, you then know it's a suspension. I need to shake it because of uneven distribution when it is just sitting stagnant. Sometimes molecules don't quite dissolve, yet they don't settle to the bottom as well. They remain distributed in the solution. This is called <clears throat> colloidal suspensions. That would be kind of like uh, ranch dressing. That would kind of be like ranch dressing um, where you would see the little bits of like parsley or onion that's like not quite at the bottom, but kind of like still suspended throughout, which say it is suspended into the dressing, right? You never find them all the way at the bottom, like some of the other stuff. The fluid that fills the cells, guys, or uh, we call it cytoplasm, and it is a, a colloidal suspension. So is blood in plasma. They are colloidal suspensions, okay? The cells are distributed in the blood plasma. So they're kind of just like, the, they're kind of just like that, that parsley and that onion in the in Italian dressing. Okay, so one more thing I want y'all to pick out of your reading today, and I'm going to end this one. <clears throat> I want you to know what aqueous solution is. Aqueous solution just means water. Aqueous solution just means water would be the true solvent. Okay, aqueous Aquarius. Aquarium, water. So just know that that means water would be the true solvent. So just remember that word. Please write it down. Please pay attention to it in your reading, okay? So.
that is the end of this chapter and I'm going to go ahead on and upload it for you and I hope you get everything that you need out of it. Please make sure that you watch it or listen to me several times and also watch the other things that I have loaded for you.